And so this morning as I teach, I don't just want us to learn information, but it's my hope that the scripture will actually form us and our hearts. We come on and say, Jesus, what do you have to say to us? I was praying for you as a community in the build-up for this morning, and the word that kept coming to mind for you was the word invitation. And so the question I have as we look at this scripture in Mark today is, what is the invitation that Jesus has for you? As we read through the text, what is invitation? Once a month, I meet with a mentor who's also a spiritual director, who's someone who helps me process my journey with Jesus from the outside. And she's this amazing older South African lady. She's in her 60s and she has the most soothing accent. She's one of those people, she could read the IKEA instruction manual and you just feel soothed to your soul. And at the end of reading the IKEA instruction manual, she'll always pause after I've poured out my life and she'll very slowly say to me, Matthew, what is Jesus' invitation to you today? So that's my question for us. What is Jesus' invitation? Why don't we just pause for a moment? I'm just going to pray, asking the Holy Spirit, and then we'll dive in to come and meet us. Come, Holy Spirit. We want to receive your invitation this morning. We want to hear these words and ask, how are you trying to form us and shape us to be more like Jesus? Would the words of the text ignite our hearts this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have a Bible, you can follow along. If you have it on an electronic device, please don't uh, look up real estate or text anyone. That would be super helpful. So the context for the story this morning that's found in uh, Mark's gospel, it's actually a story that's found in three of the gospels. So when you see that, you know this is a really important story in the life of Jesus. And it's really important to know the context. If, As we arrive at this story, Jesus has been ministering pretty much nonstop. In Mark, we have the story of Jesus telling the parables about the kingdom. And in Matthew, we actually hear that Jesus has been ministering, healing people all day. So at the end of a tired, busy day of ministry, Jesus says to his disciples, let us go away. Let's start at verse 35. That evening, when that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Now, a bit of context. Obviously, Jesus is saying here, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And that's a very practical thing. This is the Sea of Galilee, but it is actually a lake. Now, I know Canadians have like real lakes, but the Sea of Galilee, they reckon is about 14 miles north to south and about eight miles east to west. So as an Englishman, this is a significant lake, although not compared to people in Ontario. But when you think about it, they're actually going to be in this boat that's only about 20 foot long. It's like a fishing boat and going from one side to the other. When Jesus says, let's go to the other side, it does involve some sense of geography, but it also involves a place. And you're going to find that out in the next story in the Gospel of Mark. The place is actually the Decapolis, but this is Gentile territory. So Jesus is saying we're going to be leaving Jewish territory and going over to Gentile territory. This is a place of Roman occupation. So to the disciples, this was actually a scary place to go. It's interesting that Jesus is the one who does the inviting. Did you notice that? Jesus is in many ways leading them into a scary and a dangerous place. Sometimes in church, we almost have this idea that if Jesus is with us, our life will be great and easy. And when you read the Gospels, you start to realize that actually, at times, life with Jesus can be pretty scary and pretty dangerous. Life with Jesus is the best, but it's not always the easiest place. Next verse 36. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. I was really moved by this idea of leaving the crowd behind. Maybe for some of you, the invitation this morning is to actually go with Jesus to the places of solitude that are away from the crowd. It's really interesting in the Gospels, many times it says Jesus took time away into the wilderness 
into the desert places to be with the Father. We live in a world where there's lots of crowd noise and information. And often in the Gospels, the Spirit leads God's people into places away from the crowd. I think sometimes we also need to be led away from the crowd because sometimes there's a lot of crowd agenda in our world. If you go online, I try not to be online too much, but if you're online, you'll see there's lots of online debates that we can be caught up in. There's lots of conversations where we get swept up into them. And sometimes we need to step away from the crowd to use our discernment about what the Lord might be saying. One of my favorite authors, Ronald Rollheiser, says this. In the Gospels, the word crowd is nearly always used pejoratively. So much so that nearly every time the word is used, you could preface it with the adjective mindless. Crowds don't have a mind. They are fired and driven by whatever energy, hype, fad or ideology is current. So what's wrong or dangerous about crowd energy? Crowd energy is dangerous because most times it is non-reflective. It simply conducts and transmits energy rather than discerning and transforming. It's really interesting. Sometimes we need to step away from the crowd, take time with Jesus and ask, what do you want to say? I don't know about you, but many times I'll read things online and think, oh, I just want to dive in with one of my comments because I'm frustrated or angry. And I just feel the Holy Spirit say, why don't you take some time for reflection? I remember reading recently one pastor saying each day he drafts about 20 uh, messages for the website X and only posts about one of them. It goes on to say they took Jesus just as he was in the boat. Now, in the story, I think this means they took Jesus as he was in his humanity and his tiredness. But actually, when I read this, it was really interesting. The way Mark writes this as it's translated in the English, they took Jesus just as he was. I remember asking myself in preparation for this message, how often do I actually take Jesus just as he is? Or do I actually want to fit Jesus into my agenda of how I think he should be? I was talking to a friend recently about discipleship. And he said, we often want to come to Jesus on our own terms. Jesus, if you could just bless my life. I was thinking about many ways we do that in our world. There's lots of people who love social justice. Jesus, the one who's fighting different causes. There's lots who love political Jesus, who will actually meet my political agenda. There's many who love therapeutic Jesus, that Jesus will soothe me and make me feel better. Lots of people of revolutionary Jesus who's going to burn the church down and turn over the tables. Many times in my life, I really like divine vending machine Jesus. If you ever have that? Like, I just ask Jesus if you could fix my problems. I kind of put my prayer in and hope at the bottom something pops out. But what if we took Jesus just as he is? Where we come to him and surrender and say, Oh, Jesus, I don't get to fit you into my image. I actually allow you to be God of my life and I hand myself over to you. It's interesting, today is actually Palm Sunday in the church tradition and in the church calendar. And as I was thinking about that, what we see from the people of Israel is them wanting Jesus to fit their agenda. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem on that donkey, the Israelites are thinking, this is our moment. Jesus is going to overthrow the Romans and set up a state for us. He's going to destroy them all and the powerful messianic figure will be present in Jerusalem. What's interesting though is Jesus was the king they needed, but not necessarily the king they wanted. Isn't that true? Jesus was the king they needed, not necessarily the king that they wanted. And I think that's true in my own life. When I try and take Jesus on my own agenda, I forget that actually Jesus comes as he is and asks me to surrender to him. The South African theologian Andrew Murray says this, There are people who accept Christ as a priest to atone for their sins, but who do not yield to his rule as a king. 
They never think of giving up their own wills wholly and entirely to him. They come to Christ for happiness, but not for holiness. They trust in the work he has done for them, but they do not surrender themselves for the work he is to do in them. Sometimes when pastors come, it can be easy to say, oh, this is how you should live your life. But as I was thinking this week, one of the great invitations for my own life was, will you take Jesus just as he is? Verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now, this is this really interesting event that is happening. But if you actually know anything about Middle Eastern topography, you don't often get the word topography in a sermon. I thought I'd throw that in there. Or even the landscape of the Middle East. What you realize is this actually isn't an uncommon event. In fact, often because of the nature of the way the Sea of Galilee is with the mountains on either side, sometimes furious squalls would actually come up in this part of the region. One uh, also when writing about this says, the Sea of Galilee is set in the hills of northern Israel. The Sea of Galilee is actually 700 feet below sea level. The sea's location makes it subject to sudden and violent storms as the wind comes over the eastern, mount eastern mountains and drops into the sea. In fact, in the car park close to the Sea of Galilee, there's actually a sign, even to this day, warning drivers of what will happen if you park there and the winds and the sorry and the waves and the winds come up. So this is not an uncommon event, but it's also really important for us to know what the sea represents to the Jewish. So we know there's some fishermen there with Jesus as part of his discipleship crew. But to the Jewish people, the sea actually represented evil or chaos. One author says, The sea came to symbolize the dark powers of evil, seeking to destroy God's good creation and God's people. We see that in Genesis chapter 1, that there's this sense of chaos and God speaks into the chaos to bring order. We're going to find out he's going to do that in a few verses time. But as these disciples are going over to this somewhat dangerous place and this furious squall comes up, they start to realize, what is this? We're in a treacherous place and is the sea and all of evil going to swallow us? Ah. Verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Do you ever read the Bible and just actually sometimes just laugh at how humorous it is? We have this scene here of this storm raging and Jesus is asleep in the midst of it. I don't know if Mark for fun, was like, here's an extra little detail. There was a little cushion there, and Jesus had his head on it, and he was perfectly at rest. I was thinking about this. How tired must Jesus have been to be asleep in the middle of a storm like this? The part of the boat he's at is the part that would be kind of, so many waves would be coming over and swamping him. I remember my wife reading this story recently and saying to me, is Jesus just not, is he that tired that he's actually soaking wet and that tired he can sleep through all of this? The disciples wake him up and say, don't you care if we drown? Don't you notice that we are being swamped here? I know how you feel this morning. Maybe you feel like the disciples. Don't you care Jesus, have you seen my life? Maybe you have a marriage situation, maybe you have a job situation, maybe you have a health situation, and you feel like Jesus is ignoring you as you're crying out to him. Maybe this morning you come here and you do feel like your life is swamped. Sometimes as pastors, we have these moments in our lives. I know we're meant to think we've got it all together. But often my prayer is, Jesus, don't you care about my life? A few years ago, 
Uh, I took on my first ministry role in a church. I was just 30. I looked cooler and had way more hair at the time. And I'd taken on this role at a church and I knew that it was going to be somewhat of a challenging role. As associate pastor, the church had gone through some challenges. And just before taking on this role, my wife and I decided to buy a house so we could move closer to the place that I was going to be pastoring. So we bought the house. We uh, did a move. We put all the boxes in the house. And the very next day before unpacking, went to the UK because I had a short window of time to see my family who all still live there before I took my pastoring role. When we were in the UK, my wife uh, got pretty sick on and off during that trip to the point where we got back, we walked through the door, having been away, we uh, put our bags through the door, we looked at all the boxes we had to unload, and my wife started to get sicker and sicker that evening. So I rushed into the hospital, she ended up having a bunch of tests, and the next day we found out that she was diagnosed with celiac disease, Crohn's disease, and her kidneys had shut down, and she needed a kidney transplant at 28 years of age. I was just about to start this pastoral job. We hadn't unloaded our house. My wife was needing a kidney transplant. And to be honest, I feel pretty swamped. Jesus, maybe I'm actually drowning and I've just got my last few breaths at the top. I feel like I am drowning. Where are you? Now, this might seem really obvious, but it's important. Jesus is present even when you feel your boat is being swamped. Do you notice that? As they're going through this storm, Jesus is actually with them. They cry out to him and call to him for action, but Jesus isn't far off in this story. Jesus is with them in the midst of their crisis. It's interesting at the end of the Gospels when Jesus commissions all the disciples. That little line at the end, we love the part, go and make disciples of all nations. There's this brilliant vision and declaration. And right at the end, he says, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Your life may not be plain sailing, but I will be with you. A few years ago, I had a friend who went through a crisis and... His, he was in ministry and his wife left him and went off with somebody else. He was pretty in a broken place. And at the time I was working for a missions organization in the UK. And he came to spend a few days there in that place with us. And when I was there, I would sit with him and often he would be pretty too and emotional. And I'd say, how are you getting through this? And he would say, Matt, I walk the grounds of this place every single day. And there's a point in my war where I feel Jesus almost strangely come into my face and whisper, whisper to me, Paul, I love you. I have never left. Paul, I love you. I have never left you. Just a very small aside on the text. When the uh, Jewish people are reading this, I wonder, or if the disciples are understanding this, I also wonder if they reflect back on the story in the Old Testament of Jonah. Read the story of Jonah and go back and look at it. There's a lot of parallels to this story. This storm comes up, they're in a boat, people are sleeping, right? And they wake Jonah up and say, what are we going to do? We're going to throw you overboard. So the one who is sleeping in the story of Jonah is thrown overboard, whereas the one who is sleeping in this story quiets the storm. Verse 39, he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Don't you care if we drown? Not many people mention this, but I do love the fact Jesus does clearly care if they drown. He responds to them. But what Jesus says to the storm is, quiet, be still. I wonder if for some of us this morning, that trend, the invitation is actually quite literally that. How do we find spaces for quiet and stillness in our life? For me, the idea of being silent and having some time in silence has become really important to me. I could do a whole sermon on silence, which I won't do this morning. But the idea of stepping away from the noise of everyday life just to be with the stillness of God is important. 
Maybe for some of you, it's actually to bring your storm to Jesus and say, would you speak quiet and stillness to it? The psalmist reminds us that we are to be still and know that he is God. The first part is to be still, but in the stillness, we know he's God. The idea of silence and being still has been really important to me. Uh, During COVID, when I was pastoring, the church I was pastoring went through a really difficult season. Uh, Already it was difficult because we were pastoring in COVID. And then in the midst of that, we faced some really big challenges as a church. I remember reading this text partway through, and just this part stood out to me. My mind and my heart was racing and honestly, I wasn't sleeping very well. And every day I'd wake up thinking, Lord, I am not sure how to get through this day. There are many days I thought I should just quit. I'm sure I can find another job doing something. England will still have me back. They love me. I've still got the passport. It just felt really hard each day. And as I came to this text, I started to use this as a bit of a prayer in my life. Every day I would sit and my spiritual director would say to me, Matt, before you start your day, take 10 minutes of silence. Sit with the Lord. And I would say this, Holy Spirit, come. Would you quiet my heart and would you still my mind? Holy Spirit, come. Would you quiet my heart and would you still my mind. Maybe for some of us this morning, we want to bring those things to Jesus for him to speak quiet and stillness to us. Verse 40, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? I don't know how you come this morning. Maybe you're here and actually you are feeling quite anxious and afraid. Maybe you feel like my life is slightly out of control. And Jesus would say to you this morning, would you hand over control to me? I don't know what you're like. I love to be in control of things and figure everything out. And sometimes Jesus can be my last agenda rather than the starting place. And in our fear and anxiety this morning, Jesus would say, Lewis, hand things over to me. I think Jesus is saying, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Because Jesus earlier on, in the chapter had just been healing people and ministering to people. Do you not trust me that I know what I'm doing? Faith in the scripture is always related to trust. How quickly you forget. Would you remember who I am and trust me? The amount of times in my own journey, it's hard for me to remember It's interesting in the Old Testament, the word remember is repeated over and over again. And this is a very academic thing. I realized Jesus is just saying we need to remember because we so often forget. Verse 41, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this? I think all of the story is leading to this one phrase. If you read Mark's gospel, most theologians say the whole of Mark's gospel is trying to answer the question, who is Jesus? It starts out by talking about Jesus is the Messiah, the one who was promised in Mark chapter 1 verse 1. But what you see throughout the gospels is lots of people in different spaces in their life asking, so who is is this Jesus. I love this story because if you notice, it's quite humorous in many ways. The disciples are afraid, fearing for their life. In fact, they say teacher, which is interesting. They move from saying teacher at the start to who is this at the end. But they're saying, teacher, would you rescue us? Jesus actually gets up, rescues them, and they're more afraid afterwards. I think it's because they realize whose presence they are in. He's no longer just a teacher to them, 
the one who would calm the storms and change the weather is clearly not just a teacher. He is God in the flesh. Psalm 89 verses 8 and 9 says this, Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Who is this Jesus? And maybe who is Jesus at the moment to you? Are you so familiar with Jesus? You've grown up with the church thing, but you've actually not fully surrendered to his rule and reign. Maybe you're kind of following Jesus, but you have Jesus a little bit at arm's length. We can become so familiar that we forget who Jesus is and the power that he has. This week, we're going to enter into Holy Week, as Ben said. And you realize often how confusing Jesus can be. So many people are asking, who is this? The one who feels the multitude, heals the blind, the leper. He does weather-related miracles. Also gets up, takes a towel and a basin, and starts to wash people's feet. He comes to set Israel free, not by riding in on some big chariot and a horse, but on the donkey, the peace horse. Jesus comes to set Israel free by shedding blood, but it's not other people's blood, it's his own blood. At the height of his power, Jesus gives it away for others. Who is this Jesus? Paul says this Jesus who can calm the weather patterns is also with you in the storms of life in your boat. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, when talking about Jesus, in him all things hold together. A few years ago, I was reading that text, and as I was reading it, I just felt the Holy Spirit whisper to me, Matt, so why are you trying to hold all things together? As we go into Holy Week, we see Jesus riding on Palm Sunday, into a storm. It was a political, a religious, and a spiritual storm where all of Rome and Israel were colliding in one place and one moment. This week may remember the God who came in human form to be with us, the one who died and rose again, the one who on the cross conquered evil and the waters of chaos surrounding the world. The one who, through his resurrection, is going to reconcile and heal all things. One day, all storms will be calm. And as the great mystic Julian of Norwich said, all shall be well, all shall be well, and in all manner of things, all will be well. I'm just going to pause for a moment to pray as we close out. I don't know how you do things, uh, uh, Paul Kells. You may never invite me back, so that's fine, so I can do it, and then we'll move on. But there's a bunch of invitations uh, in the story this morning. Maybe it's an invitation to leave the crowd behind and go into some places of solitude. Maybe it's to be reminded that Jesus is with you when you feel swamped in your boat. Maybe it's an invitation to bring your situation to him for him to speak quiet to it. Maybe it's an invitation to surrender to the Jesus who calms the storm and you recognize, oh, I haven't yet surrendered to the God who wants to take over my life. Whatever the invitation is for you this morning, I'm just going to invite you, you're going to have a moment of quiet. And uh, as you respond, if you just want to hold out your hands and just bring your invitation to Jesus this morning.